Oh, hello there. I'm Bill Chan. I'm Nima Kong. I'm Van Chan. In this class, I'll read to all of you. Chapter 7, Section 2 of A Tale of Two Cities, Book the Second Golden Thread. S. Ah. A Tale of Two Cities, Book the Second Golden Thread. Charles Dickens. Chapter 7, Section 2 Half of the half dozen had become members of a fantastic sect of convulsionists, and were even then considering within themselves whether they should foam. Rage. Whoa. And turn cataleptic on this, but there be sitting up a highly intelligible finger post to the future. From insane or his guidance. Besides these dervishes, were there three who had rushed into another sect? Out of the circumference. And that he was to be kept from flying out of the circumference. And was even to be shoved back into the centre. By fasting and seeing his spirits. Among these. Accordingly. Manifest. But. The comfort was. That all the company at the Grand Hotel of Monseno were perfectly dressed. If the Day of Judgment had only been ascertained to be a dress day, everybody there would have been eternally correct. Such frizzling and powdering and sticking up of hair. Such delicate complexions artificially preserved and mended. Such skill and swords to look at. And such delicate honour to the sense of smell. Would surely keep anything going. Forever and ever. Then Gidley moved. These golden fetters ring like precious little buzz. And what with that ringing? And with the rustle of silk and brocade and fine linen. Far away. Places. Everybody was dressed for a fancy ball that was never to leave off. From the palace of the Tilleries. Through Mansaner and the whole court. Through the chambers. The tribunals of justice. And all society except the scarecrows. The fancy ball descended to the common executioner. Pooh. In prudence of the charm. Was required to officiate frizzled. Powdered in a gold lace coat, umph, and white silk stockings. At the gallows and the wheel of X was a rarity in Seer Paris, as it was the Episcopal mode among his brother professors of the provinces, Monsieur Orleans, and the rest, to call him presided in this dainty dress of our lord could possibly doubt that a system rooted in a frizzled hymen bordered cool laced and and white silk stocking it would see the very stars out Minsaner having eased his foreman of their burdens and taken his chocolate, caused the doors of the holiest of holiest to be thrown open, and issued forth. And what submission, what cringing and funning, what servility, what abject humiliation, as to bind down in body and spirit. Why the worshippers of Mansaner never troubled it. Bestowing a word of promise there and a smile there. A whisper on one happy slave and a wave of the hand on another. Mansaner affably passed through his rooms to the remote region of the circumference of truth. There. Mansaner turned. And came back again. The chocolate sprites. 
and was seen no more. The show being over, the flutter in there became quite a little storm and the precious little balls went ringing downstairs. There was soon but one person left of all the crowd. And he, with his hat under his arm and his snuff box in his hand, slowly passed among the mirrors on his way out. I devote you, said this person, stopping at the last door on his way, and turning in the direction of the sanctuary. With that, his feet, and quietly walked downstairs. He was a man of about sixty, handsomely dressed, haughty in manner, and with a face like a fine mask, a face of a transparent paleness, every feature in it clearly defined, one set expression on it, the nose, beautifully formed otherwise, was very slightly pinched at the top of each nostril. In those two compressions, or dints, the only little change that the face of her showed, recited. They persisted in changing colours sometimes, and they would be occasionally dilated and contracted by something like a faint pulsation. Then, they gave a look of treachery and cruelty to the whole countenance, he examined with attention the math and the lines of the orbits of the eyes, being matched to horizontal and thin. Still, in the effect of the face mage, it was a handsome face and a remarkable one. Its owner went downstairs into the courtyard, got into his carriage, and drove away. Not many people had talked with him at the reception. He had stood in a little space apart, and when Sena might have been warmer in his manner, it appeared. Under the circumstances, whether agreeable to him to see the common people dispersed before his horses, and often barely escaping from being run down. His men drove as if he were charging an enemy, and the furious recklessness of the men brought no check into the face, or to the lips, of the master. The complaint had sometimes made itself audible, even in that deaf city and dumb age that, in the narrow streets without footways, barbarous manner, but few cared enough for that to think of it a second time, and then, uh, in this matter, as in all others, the common riches were left to get out of their difficulties as they could, with a wild rattle and clatter and an inhuman abandonment of consideration not easy to be understood in these days. To be continued.